In this video, I will be discussing the concepts of spontaneous redox reactions and the operation of galvanic cells. Let's start with spontaneous redox reactions. I'm going to show you a simulation that I did, and you will have an opportunity to do something similar later. And in this simulation, I'm attempting to investigate any potential chemical reactions between zinc metal and different metal ions. So in order to do that, I'm going to add zinc to these four beakers. Each contains a different metal ion. So the first combination is going to be between zinc and magnesium ion, or Mg2+. The second combination is between zinc and zinc ion, or Zn2+. And then we have zinc and copper ion. And lastly, zinc and silver ion. So I'm going to show you the video of how you can interact with the simulation. So you're going to start with this, and then what you want to do is you want to click continue, and then you'll be able to pick the metal for the test. And if I select zinc in this case, zinc is going to be added, and then you can select C molecular scale to actually observe what happens on a macroscopic level. In this case, you can see that the magnesium ions don't react with zinc, so they come into contact with each other, but the magnesium ions kind of just bounce off the zinc, so there's no reaction. On to the second combination. The zinc ions don't react with zinc. Once again, they come into contact with each other and just sort of bounce off. It would be quite unlikely for zinc to react with zinc metal um, iron anyway. Okay, third combination. So in this case, you can actually see that the copper ions have reacted with the zinc. There is a transfer of electrons. Clearly, the zinc donates two electrons to the copper ions. The copper ions turns into copper, and zinc turns into zinc ions, which then leave the surface of the material and get dissolved into the solution. So if I were to put this um, in an actual lab, you will see the zinc metal start to dissolve. Last combination. Once again, there's a redox reaction there. You can see a transfer of electrons. The piece of zinc would donate electrons to two silver ions. So I need a two there. And that produces zinc iron and solid silver. And the zinc ions also leave the surface of the material. So this simulation is trying to highlight the fact that some combinations of um, materials will react with each other, so zinc reacts spontaneously with copper ions and with silver ions, but it does not have a chemical reaction with magnesium ions and it doesn't react with zinc ions. So I just want to define spontaneous redox reaction. A spontaneous redox reaction is a redox reaction which occurs naturally. I kind of don't want to use the word spontaneously here. Um, occurs naturally without needing an external energy source. This is probably not the best definition of a spontaneous reaction, and it's not even the most accurate, but for the scope of VC chemistry, this is the one that we're going to use. So to put simply, you can just think of a spontaneous redox reaction as a reaction that will happen if you mix two reactants together, whereas a non-spontaneous reaction is one that only happens if you supply electricity. So that's the external energy source that has to be supplied. So in the previous example, the reaction between zinc and copper ions, or zinc and silver ions, would be spontaneous redox reactions, whereas the combination between zinc and magnesium ions is not spontaneous. Another thing that I want to highlight when it comes to spontaneous redox reactions is that the only way to know for sure whether two substances will react spontaneously with each other is by conducting an experiment by mixing them together. So it's impossible for me to just look at zinc and say, I know that it's going to react spontaneously with this and not with something else. So it's not something that you can really tell. This is an inherent property of the material. So the only way to determine whether or not two substances will undergo a spontaneous redox reaction is by conducting an experiment using them. So this relies a lot on experimental result. Another fact about spontaneous redox reaction that you probably can't tell from the simulation um, is that a spontaneous redox reaction will always release energy into the surrounding. So this is an exothermic reaction. So there'll be an output of energy, 
in some form into the surrounding. And if the two reactants are in direct contact with each other, then this energy is going to be released in the form of heat. Now, you actually did an experiment of this before, which is the pop test, so the reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. This is definitely a spontaneous redox reaction. It happens immediately. The magnesium dissolves into the acid the moment that is added to the acid. And I hope you remember, but the, the test tube does get a bit warm when the reaction happens. So you can see that heat is being released into the surrounding. So that's an example of a spontaneous redox reaction that releases heat. Another example of a spontaneous redox reaction that releases heat would be any combustion that you can think of. All combustion reactions are redox, so obviously heat is released because that's the primary reason why we burn fuels. So I can have an example here for you. If we talk about the combustion of methane gas, which is you know for cooking or heating, it produces carbon dioxide and steam. And this is definitely a redox reaction because um, oxygen has a decrease in oxidation number from 0 to negative 2, and carbon has gone from negative 4 to positive 4. So it's definitely redox, and it releases heat, which is what we use a reaction for. I'm going to focus on one particular spontaneous redox reaction for the remaining uh, time in this video, and that's the reaction between copper ions and zinc. So just to recap once again, this is a spontaneous redox reaction because as you add the zinc into the copper solution, this is another example that uses copper sulfate, but it still has copper 2 plus in the solution. What happens is that the zinc will donate two electrons to the copper ions to produce zinc iron and solid copper. And the zinc iron will so dissolve away from the materials. So you can see the piece of zinc start to get smaller in size. This is probably what you will see if you conduct this experiment in the lab, is that you will see that this like copper being produced and that may potentially cover the surface of the zinc and the solution becomes less blue because copper ions is what's responsible for the color of the solution. So as copper ions is being consumed, the colors start to get lighter. This is the overall equation for the reaction that I wrote earlier, so just a recap ahead. And since this is in direct contact with each other, there will be heat being released from this reaction that you may or may not be able to feel if you do this reaction in the lab because it does happen quite slowly and not a lot of heat is released. Now what we really want to do though is we want to utilize this reaction but design it in a way that the energy output, instead of coming out in the form of heat, it actually comes out in the form of electricity, which is a much more useful form of energy to use. And this is where the idea of a galvanic cell comes in. A galvanic cell will take a spontaneous redox reaction and use it to produce electrical energy. This is achieved by separating the two reactants of the reaction and forcing the electrons to flow through a wire. And this movement of electrons is essentially electrical energy. So if you compare this setup, which is of a galvanic cell, with the one previously, in this setup, the zinc and the copper ions are now separated from each other. And this is probably the most important feature of a galvanic cell, is that the two reactants have to be separated from each other. They cannot be in direct contact with each other. But by separating them this way, though, you are forcing the electrons to go from the zinc through the wire into the other solution so that it can be received by the copper ions. And in doing so, that flow of electrons through the wire gives off electricity. Now, in this particular setup, you also see a voltmeter here, which you often see when you um, look at a galvanic cell and the voltmeter is used to measure exactly how many volt is produced from the galvanic cell. There are three general features of a galvanic cell. The first one, well, the first one are the two half cells. So each of these beakers, which contains a solution and a piece of metal is called a half cell. So two half makes a full cell. So you have a half cell, a copper half cell and a zinc half cell here. 
The second feature is a connecting wire, which in this case also is connected to a voltmeter, but it doesn't have to. And the last feature is a salt bridge. Now the salt bridge is this bridge-like structure that you will see that connects the two solutions. Essentially what a salt bridge is, is um, it's basically a piece of paper that's generally soaked with an ionic solution and it allows for movement of ions through the two solutions. So I'll explain what a salt bridge is in more details in a later slide. So this is a galvanic cell. Now, generally speaking, if you have a stack of, of multiple galvanic cells and you call that a battery, but there are single cells batteries as well. So like an AEA battery is technically only has one galvanic cell in it. But this is the primitive or fundamental structure of what a battery is. So let's talk about half cells. A half cell in general will consist of a conjugate oxidizing reducing agent pair. And we've talked about this before, but if you go back to this reaction of copper iron plus zinc going to copper and zinc ions, then the conjugate pairs here would be copper 2 plus and copper, and the other pair is zinc 2 plus and then zinc. Normally what I do when I list the pair is I always list the oxidizing agent first and then the re reducing agent later. So the left is always the oxidizing agent and the right is always the reducing agent. The reason for this is going to come clear in a future video, but that's my habit. I do recommend that you do that though. Another thing that you need in a half cell or to build a half cell is an electrode. And this is essentially just any solid that can conduct electricity and... Finally, you need an electrolyte, and this is a liquid that conducts electricity. Usually, it's an ionic solution, but there are other liquids that you can use as well. And for, for the most part, an electrolyte is a liquid, but there are solid electrolytes that you will see in the future. So in the case of the cell that we just had, if I want the two half cells, then I need to have a an oxidizing reducing agent pair. However, in this particular case, the copper, so one of the species in the pair, can also act as the electrode, and the other species in the pair, which is the copper ions, can also act as the electrolyte. So this is an example of a half cell that I can build. Now similarly, if you want to build the zinc half cell, you need a piece of zinc, and because zinc solid is also a metal, it can conduct electricity, the piece of zinc, just like the piece of copper, can also act as the electrode. And the solution can contain zinc ion. So the zinc ion can act as both a member of the conjugate pair as well as being the electrolyte. So zinc ion here. And this is the electrolyte. Same for copper iron. Now I just want to give you another example because you don't always have the electrode and the electrolyte being members of the conjugate pairs. So for example, if I want to make a half cell for the Fe3+, Fe2+, conjugate pair. Now the interesting thing about this conjugate pair is that both species are ions that are dissolved in a solution. So both species will make up the electrolyte and generally when you make this you just have like equal concentration of the uh, of the ions or you just have them both in the same solution however if you do this then your cell hasn't don't have your cell doesn't have an electrode yet so what i have to do is i have to add an electrode into this cell so that it satisfies all the requirements of a half cell but you have to make sure that this electrode is not going to interfere with the chemical reaction that will happen when you build a cell. So normally what we do here, if you need to add an electrode, you're going to use an inert electrode. So you want to make sure that your electrode only conducts electricity, but does not actually interfere with the chemical reaction. So we absolutely will not use iron, like Fe solid, as electrode in this case, because Fe solid actually can react with uh, one of the metal ions. What you're going to use is something inert, just mean that it doesn't react. So the, the go-to is carbon or graphite. 
but you can also use platinum if you have the budget, I suppose. Uh, I would just say this as a fact that we not we don't have the budget at the school, so we're going to use graphite whenever we need an inner electrode. So there are cases when your conjugate pairs cannot fulfill the roles of the electrodes and the electrolytes, and in that case, you're just going to include an inert electrode to, to make sure that you have an electrode in the half cell. All right, so once you have built your half cells, what you're going to do is you just need to connect the two half cells. I did mention this earlier. So to build the galvanic cell, you need to connect the two electrodes using a wire, sometimes via voltmeter as well. And this will create an external circuit for the cell, which allows for the movement of electrons. So electrons go through the wire. And then you also need to connect the two electrolytes or solutions of the half cells. And these are connected via the salt bridge. And this salt bridge is going to allow for ions to go through the solutions, and this is called the internal circuit of the cell. So the cell will always have an external circuit, which is the movement of electrons, and an internal circuit, which is the movement of ions. And I just have a quick explanation of what a salt bridge is. It's usually a piece of paper. Normally we use filter paper. Some I've seen it being used, tissue being used. And you normally soak that in an ionic solution using usually potassium nitrate, and, and that is your salt bridge. And you just sort of connect it between the two solutions in the two half cells. All right, so this is just another build, and I just want to show you what exactly happens on a microscopic level. So I start with the two half cells. This is the copper one with copper solid and surrounded by copper ions. Obviously, there's water and anions in the solution as well, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to show you this part. And then I have the zinc half cell with a piece of zinc and some zinc ions. In order to build this cell, I need to connect the two electrodes using a wire. And the wire itself probably will have some delocalized electrons within it because an electrical wire normally is a metal and metal has delocalized electrons, as we learned back in unit one and you also need to connect the two solutions using a salt bridge the salt bridge that we normally use is potassium nitrate so it contains potassium ion or k plus and nitrate ions or no3 minus so that's essentially the cell now during operation what will happen is electrons will be donated away by the zinc so electrons is going to go through the zinc into the wire so just pay attention to the right side of the cell for now two electrons will be donated away from the zinc and go into the wire and that's going to turn zinc into zinc iron so that's what happened on the right side of the cell now at the same time on the left side of the cell as two electrons go into the wire two electrons will exit the wire and go through the copper electrode to be received by a copper ion that is right next to the copper electrode. And that is going to turn these copper ions into solid copper. So I think the one thing that I want to emphasize is that the two electrons that are donated away um, by the zinc are not the exact two electrons that will get received by the copper ions on the other side because the both processes are supposed to happen simultaneously. But it's kind of like if you add two electrons into the wire, two electrons will come out of the wire. So the number of electrons are the same, but it's probably not the exact same electrons. It wouldn't be possible for it to happen. So once again, two electrons will be donated by the zinc into the wire. And at the same time, two electrons come out of the wire into the copper ions, turning zinc into zinc ions and copper ions into copper. So you get the exact same reaction as you did before. It's, it's just that instead of them happening, happening in the same beaker, they are happening in two different locations in this case. But the fact that two electrons go into the wire on one side and then two electrons come out of the wire in the other side means that you're going to create a flow of electrons through the wire and specifically, electron is going to go towards the copper half cell in this case. This flow of electrons is what you're after. This is electricity. 
All right, so that's all well and good. And I'm going to try it one more time. This time I just show the cations and anions in the salt bridge. So you have two electrons going out of the zinc electrode into the wire. And at the same time, two electrons come out of the wire through the copper metal into the copper ions, producing zinc ions on one side and solid copper on the other side. Now, if this just happens, the reaction is not going to happen for too long and that your cells are not going to be able to produce a lot of electricity or if any, you, you probably won't be able to detect any at all. And the problem that we're going to we have here is that the zinc side has just gained um, Zn2+. plus. So if you look at the solution or the electrolyte, the electrolyte has just become more positive. So the electrolyte has gained a zinc 2 plus so it becomes 2 plus more positive than before and then on the other side the electrolyte has just lost copper 2 plus so this is a problem that is created when you separate the oxidizing and reducing agents because when they are in direct contact with each other you will be you will have no change to the charge of the solutions because one thing turns 2 plus the other thing loses a 2 plus and the, the whole total charge the overall charge is still the same however because you have separated the two solutions you now have a situation when one electrolyte has just become more positive the zinc electrolyte has become more positive and then at the same time the copper electrolyte has become more negative and this imbalance in charge is going to prevent the cell from operating further because if, they, if one side has become more positive, it's going to be a lot harder for that side to lose more electrons. And then the copper side, because it's already a little bit more negative, it's not going to want to accept any more electrons. So this is where the salt bridge comes in. The salt bridge is there to balance the charge of the electrolytes. Now, if you look at the copper side, the copper has just lost a 2 plus ions because that 2 plus ions has just turned into solid copper. So... In order to compensate for that, you're going to have a 2 plus ions or 2 um, K plus ions, if you will. It will go into use potassium nitrate as the salt bridge. 2 plus ions will go from the salt bridge into the solutions. So the electrolyte loses copper 2 plus and it's going to gain 2 K plus ion from the salt bridge. And this is just so that the charge of the electrolyte in the copper half cell is still balanced or neutral. And then at the same time, the zinc half cell, the zinc electrolyte has just gained a zinc 2 plus. In order to counteract that, you're going to have some anions going into this solution. So it's going to also gain two nitrate ion from the salt bridge. So this is where movement of ions are created in the internal circuit in order to neutralize the charge of the electrolyte. And you may wonder what will happen if we run out of the ions in the electrolyte, sorry, the ions in the salt bridge. And if there are no more ions in the salt bridge, the cell will go, will, well, no longer function. So you do have to replace the salt bridge if you want a consistent or continuous voltage. All right, so that's essentially what happens. I'm going to show you another video here so you can see the movement in action. Um, notice that the copper 2 plus is going to be represented as the brown dots and the zinc 2 plus would be the blue dots and electrons are, are these red dots and then these are the ions in the salt bridge. All right so let's just start so you can see zinc ions in the solution, copper ions in the solution, the rest are just spectator ions you add the salt bridge and the cell is now functional. As you can see, um, electrons are going this way and it causes a reading in the voltmeter and also illuminate the light bulb. And you can see the movements of cations and anions from the salt bridge here. So the copper side is gaining electrons and K plus is going into it. And it's probably a little bit harder to see, but you actually can see copper ions going into the electrolyte because it's turning into copper as we speak. And then on the other side, what you can see is electrons going out of the zinc and zinc ions are being produced and anions are going into the electrolyte. 
Okay, so that's what the cell is in motion. I'm just going to play it one more time. So you have to add the saw bridge, otherwise the cells won't work. But the moment you add the saw bridge, you can see reading being shown on in the voltmeter, and you can see illumination on the light bulb. Okay. All right. Last time, I'm going to draw this out, and you really want to draw this into your book as well. This is the overall equation. So we're going to start, and um, you just have to take my word for it. But I promise I can draw a much better beaker than that. So that's a tragic attempt. Let's try again. We're going to be here for a while. And why I try to draw this. Um, okay, that's not the best thing. Uh, well, some sound effect here. Not the worst baker I've done, so I'm going to leave it there. And then we're going to draw one on the right side. I think I can even do a better one on paper. I don't know how much better, but it's supposed to be better. Why is this one bigger than the other one? You can already tell that I was looking when I was drawing this. Um, okay. I told you we'll be here for a while. Maybe this one. What I'm looking is actually at the dots on the writing part, which give me a little bit more structure when I draw this. All right, so the copper one, let's say the copper one's on this side. So if you have to draw... Um, a galvanic cell, you want to start by just setting up the half cell. So the first half cell, that's a very interesting shape for the piece of copper, but we're going to leave with that. So that's copper. And the solution contains copper 2+. Plus. And then on the other side, you want to draw the electrode, the zinc electrode. So there's a piece of zinc that follows by a solution of zinc ion so this is zinc 2 plus you need to connect the electrode now I tend to do a voltmeter here but you don't necessarily have to you just need to make sure they are connected to each other and then you want to put in the saw bridge we're going to use potassium nitrate as a saw bridge so just to recap what happens in the reaction that we looked at earlier the zinc is going to donate electrons to the copper ion, so there is two electrons going this way. So you can see that electrons will go from the zinc, out of the zinc electrode, through the wire, into the copper electrode until it is received by a copper ion that is in direct contact with the copper electrode. So this is the direction of electrons. It's going to go from the zinc electrode to the copper electrode. And at the same time, in order to balance the charge of the metal ions in the two electrolytes, potassium ions are going to go into the copper electrolyte, and nitrate ion is going to go into the zinc electrolyte. So when you draw a galvanic cell, the bare minimum that you need to be able to do is to identify the direction of electrons and the direction of ions so basically the external circuit and the internal circuit. And I just have one last thing to mention when we talk about these half cells and the galvanic cell is that once connected, one of the electrodes is going to become the site of oxidation. So this is essentially where electrons are lost. And if you look at this particular example, the zinc electrode is where electrons are lost. This is where electrons come out of. This electrode is called the anode. And it's going to be negatively charged because electrons are coming out of it. The acronym that you can use to remember this is ANOX. So oxidation occurs at the anode, or anode is the site of oxidation. So this electrode is the anode and is going to be negatively charged. This is the negative terminal of the battery, essentially. The other electrode will become the site of reduction. So this is where electrons are gained or electrons are going to go into it. And this electrode is called the cathode. So if the zinc is the anode in this case, the cathode is going to be the copper electrode. The copper electrode is positively charged because electrons sort of disappear from it since electrons will be gained by the copper ions in this particular example. So the cathode is positive. This is the positive terminal of your battery. The acronym that you can use to remember this is RED-CAT. Reduction occurs at the cathode. 
So red card and an ox. You don't probably need to remember both of them. If you just know red card, then the other the other one will also follow in um, because of logic. So red card, I'm not going to draw an ox. And another thing that's going to be quite useful to remember in terms of directions of flow in the external and the internal circuit is that electrons will flow to the cathode because electrons flow to the side of reduction and cations flow to the cathode. I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty neat the way that you can remember it. Cations the cathode, anions the anode. So they match, which is quite handy. So this is essentially what a galvanic cell would look like. And you can write the half equations as well. Copper ions go in, into copper by gaining two electrons. And zinc is going to become zinc ion by losing two electrons. So if I run this cell for a long period of time, the cathode is going to get bigger because you're producing more copper and the anode is going to get smaller because you, you're dissolving zinc into zinc ions. I want to end the video by showing you what happens in a regular AIE battery. Even though this is probably an old, earlier version because it's an acidic ba battery, whereas the majority of batteries that we look at these days are alkali. We'll talk about alkali conditions next year. But if you look at a battery, and I don't recommend that you actually cut the battery in half like this, but you can actually see that this the, the anode is the casing. So even though it looks like one compartment, there's actually proper desire to separate the oxidizing and reducing agents from each other such that you can have a flow of electrons throughout the material. So you have the anode here and the cathode. The cathode in this case is actually not a reactant. It's just there to be the site of reduction. So the cathode is here. So what happens when you put the battery in is that the battery is going to be connected to the device, whatever that battery operator device is, and you're going to force the electrons to come out of the anode and go through the entire device, hence powering the device, before it actually makes it to the cathode. So even though it kind of looked like you know, it's in, in the same device, the, the electron is forced to take this entire journey so that it can power the device before um, it can manage to get to the cathode. Hence, battery of a rated device. So that's essentially how battery works. And that's how we're going to end this video. Thank you.